Rich Folly. I'm here with Molly Antipal, and your book is The Un-Americans. It's a collection of stories. Um, you've had a really nice run. You were, nominate, or you were uh, nominated for the National Book Award for this uh, set of stories. Uh, congratulations, first of all. Thank you. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the title, The Un-Americans. I know the background and, and a little bit about some of the uh, characters in the story, but how did it all come together as a theme for you? You know, it was something that I figured out much, much farther along in the writing process. Like, I was just kind of writing each story with blinders on and not thinking about how it would all come together thematically. Um, but toward the end, I started to think about what the word un-American might mean for all of my characters. Uh, so a lot of the stories are inspired by my family history, notably their involvement in the Communist Party. And I just grew up hearing the stories of their tap lines and the dinnertime visits from the FBI and, and all of that. Um, but as I wrote, I became so interested in what the word un-American might mean to my Israeli characters, like what it means to 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 have this relation to, for their country to have this relationship with the U.S. that is so complex and symbiotic, and what it might mean for them. Um, and then also for my East European characters, many of whom were you know dissidents and academics and band artists and writers back in their mother countries, and what it's like to risk your lives for these politics and then come to the U.S. and realize like you're not being treated as American, and all of those years under surveillance, suddenly you're not only not being watched, you're not even being noticed. And mm -hmm. what does that mean? Yeah. So that's how it all came together. And the communism component, I mean, this is something where uh, a lot of your characters lived under communism or mm -hmm. fought for communism or believed in communism for a long time, including people in your own family, obviously, um, and now that it's not there anymore. And the idea of this thing that was so central to their lives disappearing almost from, the, from their world uh, is a pretty powerful part of this book, too. Yeah, I thought about that so much, and I just I thought about that so much for my grandfather, who had you know really like risked his family because of these beliefs that were so central to him, and what it was like to actually find out what was happening in Russia, and what it was like for him to find out that this cause he dedicated his life to might have been corrupt, and just what that does to someone like on a psychological and emotional level was something I thought so much about when I was writing. Yeah. So how when did you decide? When did you put it all the pieces together and realize that there was a theme there? that you could grab onto. Did you start writing these stories and then sort of find the theme, or did, it, did you start with the theme and work out? No, I just started, I started writing the stories with no idea what the theme was. And to be honest, I was worried about it. I mean, the book took me 10 years, and so so much of my life you know, was changing in those 10 years. But while I was writing, I just kept thinking, OK, I, I don't want to bore myself, and I want to do something really different with each story. So you know, if I wrote one from a man's point of view, the next one would be from a woman's point of view, and one would be historical, and the next one would be contemporary, or you know, they take place in Israel, in the US, and Europe. But it was, it was as I got to the end of the book that I realized it was exactly the thing that you're talking about, of, you know, of sort of what it means to dedicate your entire life to a cause and what happens if it loses relevance in the course of world events and what do you do with yourself after that. Yeah, and you're, a lot of that came, as you said, from your own family. Mm -hmm. It sounds as if you have a great storytelling uh, legacy in your family. Tell mm -hmm. me about like, your grandparents and some of the stories that you heard growing up. I mean, I heard a lot of the, you know, the, story, the McCarthy era stories, and um, I think there's a way with my family, and it's probably the best thing that I learned as a writer, is like, no matter how dark things are, you should always just find the humor in them. And it's almost like the more dark and, and difficult the things are, like, the more there's like, some way to kind of find like, a reason to laugh about it. Mm -hmm. and, and I always felt growing up that, that like, if, I was, if some, everyone was going to turn to me at the dinner table and listen to me, I had to have a good story. And so I was just sort of aware of like, what it meant to tell a good story early on. Yeah. You the, the other element of this is the fact that your your name is the name of the village that your family is from, mm -hmm. Antipal, and that you found the history of that town, and that sort of led you down this path to writing these stories. How did that happen? Well, that happened, I was, about 10 years ago, I spend a lot of time in Israel. I spend about three months out of the year there. And there was one year, um, right after college, when I was living there full time, and I wound up at like a friend of a friend's um, holiday party in Haifa in the north and I like knew no one at the party and I was feeling kind of lonely and lame and was just kind of looking for someone to talk to at the party and I ended up talking to this elderly woman who was from the village of Antipol and I had never met anyone from Antipol and it was honestly it was almost the sort of like mythical dark place that no one in my family talked about because you know the people that were able to leave and come to the US like mm -hmm. that was a part of their past that they didn't want to talk about it and everyone who stayed you know died during World War II and so it was just this place that I knew nothing about and she was the first person who'd ever talked to me, this like random woman I just met at a party. And she led me to an oral history book that was written in Yiddish, Hebrew, and English that was all about this village. And, um, and it was like the most amazing thing. And that was really the moment that I started writing this book, was just kind of hearing all these other people's stories about this place. So much of the book as I read it um, are these stories that uh, of family or of, of these sort of broken connections. And I, I found with each one of them, 
that there was not always full resolution. Like within a novel, you'll often find yourselves kind of tidying things up at the end and finishing the story, or at least kind of leading you down the end of that chapter of that story. With your short story, so often you don't know exactly what happens to these people afterwards. You're sort of dropped off at the end, and you just have to sort of wonder and hope. Right. Yeah, it's a totally different way of writing. Do you also write novels? I'm writing a novel now. Yeah. Uh, and it's like in such early stages that I can't tell if, how different it will be. But I think that's something that I love about stories is like, it's almost like ending at this moment, this like crux in someone's life when you know everything's about to be totally different but you don't quite know how. Mm -hmm. And you're left just trying to figure out like what, you know, what is going to happen to this person. And, and after I finish these stories, I still don't know what will happen to these people. Yeah. So tell me, you said it took you 10 years to write mm -hmm. this book. That seems like almost for some writers who are like, you know, writing really frequently a luxurious amount of time, and yet that's what it took for each one of these stories to come to life and for that theme to come together, and now you're nominated for a National Book Award, so you're doing something right. But do you think you'll have that much time to put into the next work, or now that you've sort of broken through with this book and people know who you are and they're looking for your next work, do you think you'll have that much time again to write? I mean, I hope I don't have to spend 10 years working on the next one. I mean, in those 10 years, I was also just learning how to write. Like, mm -hmm. I was learning how to write a scene. I was learning how to write dialogue. And so I would write so many stories that I would, like, throw my heart into, and then I would just throw them away. Because mm -hmm. I was just like, okay, this is what it takes, like, for me to just learn how to write a story. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping that as it goes on, it won't take me 10 years. Mm -hmm. But so it might. I don't know. I'm not, yeah, I'm not a fast writer, and I'll never be someone who has a book a year. So you mentioned, too, your own family um, and their history, your Eastern European history, the sort of immigrant story and the, the connection to communism and some of your family. And then your generation doesn't have that. Do you worry at all that some of those stories will not get passed along, or is it important to you to kind of continue the stories of, of where you come from? Uh, that's such a good question. No one's ever asked me that. I. I, to me, it seems so important, and I think about it so much with this, you know, with my grandparents' generation, you know, this is, you know, sort of like their last time to tell the stories. And actually with my grandfather, I've been doing this thing where every time I get together with him, I have all these cassette tapes, and I just record all of his stories and, like, all of our conversations, and I've been transcribing them so that, you know, my future kids can just hear these stories and hear what it was like for him to, you know, the communist stuff and also what it was like to own a bar in Brooklyn at this, you know, at this time in history, and here are all the stories in the bar, and just all of those things feel so important to me. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't know what it will be like. And I guess my, my mother and father's stories will, will feel the same way to my kids as, as my grandparents' stories feel to me. If there's um, any uh, lesson about sort of the changing face of, of politics, so, so much of this book really has sort of political underlinings. I mean, mm -hmm. um, and the sort of uncertainty of what's going to be around tomorrow in terms of politics, I mean, have you, what would it be for you as you think about it going forward? Oh, that's interesting. I, well, one thing I thought a lot about is, one, I, I felt it was so important for me when writing this book is not to make this sort of like a p capital P political book, like not where I'm trying to impose any of my own politics, my own political mm -hmm. messages on my readers, but rather I was thinking so much about what is it like if, um, for so many of these characters, I feel like they're so swept up in trying to fix the world that they don't quite see what's happening to the people closest to them and what's mm -hmm. ha actually happening in their own homes. Mm -hmm. So I think that that would be the main thing about politics that I was the most interested in is sort of how does it work on both a, you know, a, 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 a macro but also an incredibly micro, almost emotional level. Mm -hmm. Well, the book is The Un-Americans by Molly Antipal. Beautiful stories. Thank you. And congratulations on all the wonderful things happening to you with this book. It's really nice to have you here at PBS. Oh, thanks so much for having yeah, me. Thanks so much.